Welcome to our last session for today. Um, I think it's a session of great importance as well, looking at the audience that we have and the number of young people and uh, young women that we have here. So it definitely is uh, reflected in a lot of uh, interest. Uh, today's session is going to be looking at uh, issues of uh, gender and youth le lessons and uh, actions. We will have uh, two perspectives, one on one side academia and on the other side practitioners' point of view, which would bring them uh, would bring complementary discussions and uh, points to raise. Our first speaker is uh, Maisun uh, Sokaria. Sorry, my apologies. So, Maisun Sokaria, teaching at uh, King's College, uh, quite knowledgeable on issues of youth education, development, and social movement in the Arab region, and has been uh, both teaching and studying at AUC and AUB. Uh, so perspective from different sides of the region as well. And uh, we'll start her presentation right away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, you know, there were so many mentions that were dropped throughout our conversation today about youth, youth bulge, human development, that I'm going to challenge a little bit and like, you know, step back and think about them in a more critical way. Uh, so, uh, I am going to focus my uh, talk on the Arab Human Development Report 2016, which was totally f uh, focused on the youth issues. So, uh, the report was uh, published just in November, and it is subtitled as Youth and the Prospects for Human Development in a Changing Reality. Uh, the report was the first Arab Human Development Report to focus exclusively on the question of youth in the region. And as Sophie de Khan, director of the Regional Bureau for Arab States and the United Nations Development Program said at the launch of the report, the wave of uprisings that have swept across the Arab region since 2011 has shown us that we can no longer treat young people in the Arab region as passive dependents or a generation in waiting, which was, you know, the, the view of them before. So the new Arab Human Development Report can be read in a number of different ways. Well, it represents the return of the Arab Human Development Project that had been interrupted by the Arab uprising. Um, uh, the, the report, the Arab Human Development Reports have been produced since 2002 with a total of six reports, 2003, 2000, uh, 2002, 3, 4, 5, 9, and then till uh, 2016. And the last one of on use appearing just like in the past 15 years. These reports have been the focus of small but growing school of criticism that point out the ways in which these reports are highly ideological and political. Uh, they have been used to legitimize intervention by international uh, organization in the Arab region. Uh, the ways in which these reports often promote problematic culturalist and deficit-based um, representation of the Arab world, the Human Development Index and deficits on so many levels, and the ways in which these reports tend to support the continuation of neoliberal political economic reforms across the region. Certainly, all of these criticism remain relevant when we look at the current 2016 report. Well, uh, the report, the current report epitomizes the Arab youth paradigm that has increasingly come to frame development discourse and practice in the region. As youth studies research has noted, the social category and identity of youth is not universal. Uh, and up until a few decades ago, uh, it was of limited relevance in most of the countries in the Arab region. Certainly, it was rare to see much attention paid to the issue of youth in development programs or public policy debates. All of this started to change during the 1990s as youth began to move to the center stage of development discourse. It's really um, become center after the war on terror because it was the young middle class uh, Muslims or Arabs who committed 9-11. So it becomes a discourse also to justify the war on terror and more intervention. The World Bank focused uh, uh, yes, yeah, so it began to move uh, in all development. So, for example, the World Bank focused its 2007 World Development Report totally on the question of youth, along with other international organizations like the UN, ILO, 
uh, they uh, regularly hold summit on youth issues. Likewise, national government and regional association all over the world have adopted youth policies, youth ministries, etc. Uh, the report at hand fits directly into this discourse, and there is a little that differentiates the report from previous report, uh, such as the World Bank. Actually, it stands on the right of the World Bank report on youth. It's, um, um, so there are different ways to understand the reason behind this growing concern with youth, but one of the arguments that myself and others have made is that youth as a social category and identity has become particularly useful in the context of global neoliberalism in the work of renegotiating and eroding welfare and development state entitlements. But there is a third concern in which a, uh, the report needs to be understood. And this is what I want to focus on in my talk today. For AHDR 2016 also is closely connected with a number of other reports and conferences over the past couple of years that have been strongly promoting the securitization of youth, uh, both regionally and globally. Anti-radicalization movement, prevent movement all over the world, um, especially in Europe. In December 2015, the Security Council unanimously uh, adopted Resolution 2250 uh, on youth, peace, and security. The role of youth lies at the heart of international peace and security. Former UN Ban Ki-moon uh, has claimed, we have to encourage young people to take up the causes of peace, diversity, and mutual respect. The resolution, in turn, was part of a larger set of international policies, platforms, summits, and conferences that have been developed over the year period, uh, two-year period on youth and security, including White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism, uh, in Washington, D.C., February 2015, European Youth Against Violent Extremism in Oslo, June 2015, Amman Youth, Amman youth Declaration on Youth, Peace, and Security, the Global Youth Summit Against Violent Extremism in New York City in 2016. So, and the resulting youth action agenda to prevent violent extremism and promote peace. All of these are closely networked and refer to one another. From these meetings and documents, a further set of uh, action programs, research agendas, and funding streams are promised, all of which target global, um, mostly Arab youth, because it's all about extremism and radicalism, uh, as central subject and actors for international peace and security. Well, in some respect, none of this activity is particularly new. From its origin, youth as a social concept and category has been linked with security concerns. Um, the whole concept of use with, uh, started with capitalism is, uh, I can talk about that later, it's a long history. But, um, however, the recent proliferation of international activity on youth and security also represents an important shift. Youth is now moving from being predominantly a local and national security concern to now becoming a central global security concern. This has occurred through the double movement of youth becoming concerned for international development policy and discourse at the same time as development policy and discourse was becoming ever more tied into global security concerns from the 1990s onward. In this context, global youth, Arab youth, have emerged as an important frame for articulating and acting on elite anxieties about overlapping sets of security concerns. Two key points stand out. First, the concept of youth bulge, which was mentioned earlier so much, and it's everywhere. It's like we are a youthful country, the Arab youthful region. Uh, it has been embraced as a politically acceptable euphemism for talking about the problem of rapidly expanding what I call surplus population in the post-welfare and development uh, state. Second, the ideal of youth as peace builders now joins other ideal roles of youth as entrepreneurs, active citizens, and change agents as ideological models for interpolating young people and supporting for at least reclaiming uh, from directly contesting the contemporary global economic order. The most important way in which Arab youth has become linked to global security concern is through the concept of the youth bulge. Most of the recent youth, peace, and security documents make reference to the concept of the Arab youth bulge. The Amman Declaration opens with the claim that the last, late, largest generation of youth in history makes it a democratic, democra demographic imperative to include youth in global security agendas. The Arab Human Development Report 
uh, explains its focus on youth by noting that there is an unprecedented demographic wave, mass and momentum in the Arab world caused by the fact that young people between the ages of 15 and 29 make up nearly a third of the Arab region's population, while another third are below the age of 15. So, while youth, theory, while youth bulge theory has existed for decades, it took, it took off in the late 1990s, promoted by individual close actually to the United States security establishment as a way to explain political instability in the Arab world and recruitment to international terrorist networks. I'm quoting, in many ways, current youth bulge discourse in the direct is a direct successor to claims made in previous era that form the problem of overpopulation in the global south as a threat to U.S. national security interests and population control in this region as an essential development priority for protecting these interests. The difference is that in the context of Cold War politics, U.S. foreign policy leaders worried that growing population in low-income countries would lead to increased economic and political instability and foster the spread of communism. Now the threat is uh, Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism. So youthful theory has been criticized for drawing on stereotypical and unfounded claims about youth, and particularly male youth of color in the global south. Early versions of the theory tend to make strongly deterministic arguments. Samuel Huntington, for example, claimed that there are three uh, threshold tipping points in society, such that when the proportion of the population aged 15, 24 is higher than 20%, it's much higher in the Arab world, civil unrest and political violence will ensue. Youth, and especially young men, are said by youth bulge theorists to be more inclined to violence and conflict than other age groups, since they are allegedly highly idealistic, sensitive to peer approval, prone to risk taking, and na naively accepting of ideological explanations. However, while such criticism are important, youth bulge theory today in some ways is not specifically about youth in and of itself. First, there is a considerable variation in how the youth bulge is defined. It can be and often is used as shorthand for referring to youthful and expanding populations more generally, and can include everyone under the age of 30. In media policy and academic discussion, there is frequently an easy sliding back and forth between the ideas of a youth bulge and a youthful or young age structure in Arab population. Second, the significance of the Arab youth bulge is often spoken of in relation to the problem of a lack of economic opportunity. Uh, but economists argue the economic climate is, uh, at the time, young people enter into the labor market is particularly crucial, as youth will be especially vulnerable to unemployment if their entry into the labor force co coincide with periods of serious economic decline. Well, in such situation, it is argued that youth bulge can sometimes lead to social unrest and political conflict, not necessarily due to any innate characteristic of the young, but due to the comp uh, competition over limited resources and opportunities. Indeed, in other contexts, it has been recognized that large youthful population may even be a boom to the economy and can actually enhance economic growth if the youth can be absorbed into new jobs. Some thus argue that youth bulge can be either a demographic dividend and opportunity or alternatively a demographic bomb disaster or challenge. However, what the Arab youth bulge concept is effectively talking about is a problem of surplus populations in the current post-welfare, post-development state. Over the past decade, a number of social scientists have returned to Marx's notion of relative surplus population arguing that one of the distinctive features of global neoliberal capitalism has been the growth in numbers of people who are rendered as structurally unnecessary to a capital-intensive capital economy, who sees being of value as workers and consumers, and who are expelled from the core social and economic orders of our time. This has been variously discussed as a human waste, social abjection, advanced marginality, wageless life, and expulsion. The shift in society toward the growing production of surplus population is often explained as a product of technological displacement of labor from capitalist production and globalization of capitalism, which has led to the displacement and dispossession of people who have previously enjoyed alternative livelihood. So the concept of youth bulge uh, provides elite with a politically politically legitimate way of talking about the problem of surplus populations. 
for its shift attention from contradiction internal to global capitalist society to apparently external challenges that are created by the combination of high fertility rates, poor governance, and limited development in countries of the Arab world. Once we recognize that the youth bulge can be used as a rhetorical frame for articulating concerns about surplus population, it's easier to understand one of the core paradoxes of recent global youth development policy that has often been noted by researchers. So despite the ostensible concern with youth economic exclusion and unemployment, there is a little evidence of any shift away from the neoliberal development agendas that have been widely linked to producing such exclusion and unemployment, nor of any mass employment programs that might be expected to effectively address these problems. So the overriding concern of Arab youth, peace and security agenda is that surplus population youth are at risk of being radicalized and pulled into violent forms of extremism. Security Council Resolution 2250 warns that the rise of radicalization of violence and violent extremism, especially among youth, threatens stability and development. The Arab Human Development Report claims that Violent radicalization has become a particular concern, indeed a defining feature across the Arab region, particularly among youth, that has revealed itself in terrible ways and caused grave, uh, grave damage to societies across the religion and around the world. So it's the radicalization of youth that is creating all these problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, <laughs> so I'm, I'm running to... The, uh, don't worry, we still have about five more minutes, okay. also for the interpreters to be able to follow with the conversation. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, so it's, so, you know, and this, uh, so first, first of all, like, we need to question why radicalization is a bad word, like, in the 60s, being radical was good, because you are talking about structural changes. Yes. Being radical is looking at the structural causes of what, creates a problem. Now radicalization is totally connected with Islamism and, um, and fundamentalism. So there is a shift from or co-optation of the word radicalization. Second, when you, uh, when you like make you, you are young people as a cause of radicalization, it means that um, you know, they are causing all these problems. It's not like the terrorists, the terror of the states, whether it's international states or the Arab regimes. Mm -hmm. So the principal concerns of the threat of youth radicalization and extremism in these reports and conferences is to seek to engage youth directly as peace builders themselves, doing counterterrorism and anti-radicalization work at the local, national, and global level. So in this, the Arab youth peace and security agenda fits closely with trends in the broader securitization of development itself, not only of youth. For it is argued that narrow and traditional state responses to youth radicalization often, often tackle only the symptoms of the problem rather than addressing the factors driving participation in violent extremism and can further aggravate tensions and trigger more support for violent ideologies. There is consequently a need for a more expansive and particularly and participatory approach that engages youth as key allies in building reliance, resilience against violent extremism. The overarching purpose is get youth, all youth, to embrace a culture of peace, tolerance, dialogue, as the Arab Human Development Report argues, and a vision of a peaceful global society above all else and reinforce the endlessly repeated mantra that there is no development without peace and there is no peace without development. Yes, well, all of this can sound highly appealing. It's also likely this agenda can open up space for valuable youth peace building work. Nevertheless, it's vital to take a close critical look at what exactly is being said and done in the name of this new youth as peace builder discourse. First, the youth peace and security agenda adopts an essentialist view of peace as being self-evidently and un unproblematically desirable, with violence and conflict being unquestionably bad and undesirable. Well, of course, peace is good, but sometimes it's the harmony ideology. We have to accept just to, um, not to create conflict. Uh, statements about seeking the commitment of Arab youth to a culture of peace tend to be made without qualification. The problem with this approach is that it disregards that some conflict may be necessary, such as when social groups are struggling for equality and social justice. Some, group, some groups in conflict-affected societies might strongly believe that before justice exists, they cannot consider peace. 
So the AHDR 2016, for example, fails to clearly differentiate between the violent conflicts of the Arab uprising that challenge authoritarian regime across the Arab region and the violent conflicts of the elite-led counter-revolution that ensued. So there is a huge, the, it's the mix. So the violence, the violence of the Arab Spring led to the civil war. So it's like, you know, it caused over and over again that because young people took to the street and that it was youth revolution and they acted, then we got, see where we get. So the aftermath of the Arab Spring is also a problem of young people. Um, the call made for AHDR for education that will help youth appreciate the value of peace and in reorientation programs that instill the value of peaceful coexistence in youth that can be seen uh, in, uh, as deeply problematic and concerning. For this call is based on claims that hold Arab youth more responsible than other groups for violent conflict in the region. It fails to address the regional and global structural violence, inequality and injustice that make commitment to peace impossible in current context, and it actively seeks to, uh, to suppress or redirect the kinds of challenges to the political and economic status quo that erupted so impressively in the Arab Spring. Second, the practice of youth peace building itself, though repeatedly endorsed in the global youth peace and security agenda as being self-evident and unproblematic, is left vaguely defined. When it is defined, the model of peace building promoted in the youth peace and security agenda is the liberal peace building approach that has been associated with the UN, World Bank and international organizations since the 1990s. This approach posits that the surest foundation for peace is market democracy and sees peace building as transplanting Western models of social, political, and economic organization into all shattered states and pursuing political and economic liberalization. For example, the Amman Declaration calls on government to prioritize youth employment opportunities and inclusive labor policies, teach youth skills to meet the labor demands and work with the private sector as partners in youth employment and entrepreneurship programs. While these might sound like promising ways to address youth economic marginalization and exclusion, the call by international organization in the current period to, up, to open up job opportunities for the young has overwhelmingly been tied to a standard set of neoliberal demands for privatization, market deregulation, and rollback of work place protection for older workers, uh, reformers that actually tend to harm, not help the economic standing of youth and other workers alike. This link is made clear, for example, in the report, which blames youth development problems in the Arab world on the large size of the public sector and calls uh, a shift to more private sector employment and, uh, and removal of the tight restriction and protection that inhibit free movement of goods, people, and capital in the region. The call to become a young peace builder can appear noble and utopian. What many now argue is that the liberal peace building model that has prevailed for the past three decades is not about pushing for a radical redistribution of political and economic power that could effectively address the marginalization of youthful surplus population. It is about deploying the uplifting rhetoric of peace and peace building to build and maintain ideological support for a neoliberal global order that is massively unequal and that protects and serves the interest of national and global elites in the first instance. When young people are asked to become peace builders, then we need at least to consider carefully the exact nature of the peace they are being asked to help build, and whether this peace supports or contests the fortification of the existing order and the preservation of the instability of hegemonic violence. So to conclude, like um, there are different, the rise of uh, youth as a discourse in the Arab world has passed through different uh, representations. So they start, we started by youth as terrorists in the, um, uh, after the war on terror. Then they become the Arab Spring was a youth revolution. They became revolutionary. And then now they are the peace builder and the surplus population. But underlying all these reports, there is one constant that is pushing for neoliberal policies that are creating more injustices, not only in the Arab world, but everywhere. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maisun. Very interesting, and I'm sure a lot of debate is going to come from that. Uh, our next speaker is Hibak Osman. 
she's the founder of uh, Karama Organization, an organization that has been working on issues uh, of uh, gender and to end violence against women and deliver sustainable, inclusive peace and democracy in the Arab region. Uh, the organization has been quite active over the past uh, years and it aims to put women uh, on the agenda and to make sure that women are the center of humanitarian response and conflict uh, prevention and resolution. Hibak, the floor is yours. Thank you. And for including me in this uh, important conference. This conference is looking back at the last 10 years, but in the Arab region we really only need to look back as far as six years to identify uh, the key social, political, and cultural movement. The Arab revolutions of 2011 and their repercussions are absolutely central, and this is especially true when we look at the situation of women and women's movements in the region. But we must also recognize that while the revolutions were the common event to nearly all the countries we are discussing at this conference, the context in which they occurred were all very different. As such, the results and lasting effects are unique, and we could spend an entire session and indeed an entire conference on each. Bearing this in mind, it's nonetheless instructive to look at the individual countries to explore how women created space for themselves within the public debate and the effects, the effect of women's activism, uh, the effect women's activism had in starting or nurturing and accelerating the revolutions. The reactions against women's movements and women's rights that followed and the challenges we face now. We will see that the reaction against women involved involve both physical violence and institutional discrimination. Egypt has the largest population of any country in the Arab region, and in 2011 it witnessed what were probably the largest public demonstrations of all revolutions in the region. At the very height of uh, weeks long protests, it is estimated that uh, there were two million people in Tahrir Square alone, with cities and towns across the country also hosting demonstrations. Research carried out at the time by the Gallup polling company suggested that one third of the protesters on the streets of Egypt were women. As well as the sheer number of women involved in the protests, we should not underestimate the symbolic importance that women's involvement had in galvanizing the movement. When women get involved, the family gets involved, the community gets involved, and the village gets involved. Uh, so it's extremely important to understand that, that women's involvement really sustains that movement. And I think maybe sometimes I feel this is why, you, you know, uh, different uh, movements or the extremists or Islamic, some Islamic movements uh, basically try to curtail the movement of, uh, of women at that time, and we have seen that in Egypt and other places. Women's participation legitimized the protests in the eyes of ordinary people. Women certainly had something to say about their situation. They needed to make their voices heard. Women not only brought their views, they brought their families, they brought the communities to the protest and made it ultimately the, uh, uh, sustainable. Despite playing this fundamental role in bringing about the end of the regime, Egyptian women were the hardest hit by the reactionary backlash that followed. Many women involved in the protest had already faced the horror of sexual assault. Street harassment and sexual assault were already serious problems for women in Egypt. The breakdown in security that accompanied the revolution saw them reach epidemic proportions. A 20, uh, in a 2008 study of Egyptian women found that 83% of the respondents had been sexually harassed. A similar study carried out in 2013 found that that figure had risen to 99%. Discrimination expressed through harassment and violence had become the daily reality of women in the streets. Where did this hostility atmosphere leave the place of women in public life? Immediately the few gains that women had secured to further and protect their rights came under threat while hard-won gains were wiped out with the quota of women's uh, representation in parliament, one of the first things that had to go. Uh, when the revolutions happened in each country, for example, in Egypt, the first things that the, that, that the Islamists went after were the women's rights. I mean, you would think that they will, 
be obsessing about security and the economy, the two important issues for the society in Egypt. But they went after the women's rights. And what they have done was basically link women's rights issues to the regime and basically called it Susan Mubarak um, uh, uh, laws, uh, which was, of course, the first thing that went out was the quota that basically made sure that 64 uh, women were, uh, were, uh, were, were appointed to the parliament. That went. The other issue that really almost came out of the window was the was family law. Uh, you know, uh, divorce, um, uh, the hula, and also the custody. Those were the laws that they really went after. And uh, that shouldn't really surprise many people. Um, however, it was not as organized. Uh, uh, under the previous regime, Egypt did have a small civil society to speak of through which women could organize. However, it was not as organized and prepared for the transition as its opponents. Indeed, arguably, no political or social movement in Egypt was as well organized as the Islamists. When we do look for common factors we see across the region and the response in individual countries to the revolutions and the reactions against them, the role, size, and organization of civil society, which is hugely important. Where women have not been organized, or where civil society has not being restricted, women have been more readily targeted by reactionary backlash. Countries where civil society has been stronger and more well-established have been far more resilient to the backlash. You know, of course, Tunis uh, uh, comes to mind. When we look at Egypt, we find that one of the most effective methods that reactionary forces used against established women's rights was to smear them by association with the previous regime. Laws on women's rights, you know, like I said, you know, became Susan Mubarak's law. Um, the reactionary forces saw that this is an opportunity to throw the unwanted baby of gender equality out with the bath water of the previous regimes. This smearing of women's movement was unfortunately extremely successful. Even now, women political candidates worry that they will be perceived as running on two explicit pro-woman agenda. Many political parties see this as a bad election strategy, and this perception still holds women back from the front line of politics. So women's participation in the transition was severely limited. After the women's quota was scrapped, less than 2% of, uh, uh, of uh, members of parliament retained in the first election. The first constitutional committee formed after the revolution had no women members. The second 85 member committee included just two women. At this point, Egyptian women had already seen gains wiped out, where they had thought that their transition would offer them more rights and protections. Instead, they were fighting to simply hold on to what they had. However, one opportunity that the revolution had given to women was greater ability to organize themselves. This was the gift of the revolution. And again, this is the case across the region. Nearly everywhere, women and civil society are better organized, more confident, better connected locally, nationally, and regionally. It was thanks in large part to this new level of organization that women were able to secure a far better outcome in the drafting of Egyptian, Egypt's new constitution than, uh, than expected. Thanks to the lobbying of both influential women at the top of Egyptian society and the women's movement representing communities, the new constitution included 19 articles relating to fundamental rights of women. Grassroots movements and campaigns helped to raise awareness of the 19 articles and to create overwhelming popular support for the constitution. These campaigns also played an important role in securing the 2014 changes to the Egyptian penal code that for the first time criminalized sexual harassment in public. In, the, uh, in public, in the workplace, in education, and within the family. This has, of course, been far from the end of the story. The struggle faced by the women's movement is every bit as serious and complex now as it has been. The power that women showed during the revolution and facing the subsequent backlash has, though, had great symbolic power and provided impetus for greater organization. Women recognize their power and influence now, which is hugely important. But across the region, the space that women so painstakingly carved out for themselves in public life is now being eroded. Women who fought to make themselves heard are now having to fight every bit as hard just to remain uh, where they are. Having looked at the way that women's movements were pushed aside following the revolution in Egypt, I want to explore briefly another way that women are marginalized in the region, the sexual assaults 
we saw on the streets uh, in Cairo and elsewhere in the region where one of the most brutal methods of targeting women literally excluding them from public space. We know from both from academic research and bitter experience that women, that when, when peace and security break down, it's women who suffer disproportionately. In conflict and during civil disorder, it's women who are more likely to be victims of sexual and gender-based based violence, who are more likely to be displaced and to be marginalized in political and peace processes. This disproportionate way in which women suffer in conflict and crisis has long been recognized. In 2000, after many years of international pressure from activists, experts, and member states, the, United, the, the UN Security Council formalized the basis for the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda when it unanimously agreed uh, Resolution 1325. The resolution set out the four pillars of Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, protection, prevention, participation, and relief and recovery. This aimed to deal with the way that women are marginalized and victimized during conflict and recognize the crucial role that women have to play in preventing conflict and building peace. Each member state was expected to draw up their own individual tailored strategy to ensure the needs of women affected by conflict. Nearly 17 years after the resolution was agreed, only two countries in the Arab region have, uh, have national action plans for the implementation of 1325. And they haven't still implemented it, but they have you know, they, they promised they would. That figure seems to strike enough, but I just want to add a bit more context to it. The agreement of uh, the Colombian peace deal uh, last year singled the end of the last, ongo of the last ongoing conflict in the Western Hemisphere. In effect, it marked peace over an entire continent. In contrast, the Arab region, home to just 5%, of the world's population is currently witnessing an extraordinary level of conflict and misery. In 2014, seven out of 10 of the world's battle deaths and nearly half of all terrorist attacks took place in the region. Arab countries host nearly six out of 10 of the world's displaced people. Now in Yemen, Somalia, and South Sudan, millions of lives are threatened by famine driven by conflict. It's this context that only two countries in the region have chosen to recognize the extraordinary toll that the conflict takes on women. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's shocking, it is uh, the, sh shocking, shockingly lack of political will that explains the marginalization and absence of women in peace processes in the region. From Yemen to Sudan to Syria to Libya, women are almost nowhere to be seen. I mentioned earlier that women have a crucial role when it comes to peace, and this is something we have the evidence to prove. When women are part of peace processes, it has a 35% more likely to last for 15 years, or more than, or more than a process that excludes women. Women's participation is then not simply an issue for women, it's an issue for everyone who desires peace. We and our partners have been making the case for greater women's participation in the Syria pro peace process. We have now reached a point where the proportion of women involved at the level, um, women involved is at a level unprecedented in any previous peace processes. What makes this a remarkable statistic is what this means in reality. In the last set of negotiations, the regime, the regime and the opposition each had teams of 15 negotiators and on each side, just three women. Women have been so marginalized in global peace processes for so long that representation just one in five is a record. It is a shameful record. The numbers, of, uh, of course, do not tell the whole story. We, as activists, do not simply want women to be at the negotiating table, but for the women's agenda to be on the table. This is, again, where the role of civil society is as representative and voice for the community is crucial. There has been progress here in Syria with the creation of the Women's Advisory Board to the Special Envoy being the first of its kind. But these women are not formally participants in the process. They have made, they have made it as far as the corridor of the talks, not at the table. And this is very important to remember. Mechanisms and Mechanisms for the participation of civil society in political and diplomatic processes already exist, but it is all too rare that we see them. A means to allow civil society to speak at the UN Security Council has only been used twice in the two years since it was agreed, despite UN officials declaring that the world faces its greatest humanitarian crisis in over 70 years. It's here that we see a crucial 
commonality between those countries in the region in transition and those still facing conflict. Over the last decade, we have made much progress in the international and national frameworks of preventing violence and discrimination against women. New constitutions and articles, new laws, the abolition of old laws, new mechanisms and resolutions. The challenge that remains at nearly every level is the implementation of these changes. What protection? What protection does the law provide if it's not seriously enforced? A resolution that lacks the political will and resources to see it implemented remains just words on a page. This is again where civil society can play its role. Grassroots movements are able to reach deep into the communities, making them aware of their rights and mechanisms available to them. They are able to report on the effectiveness of the national and international policies and provide invaluable information to hold institutions to account. Through the revolutions and conflicts, women in the Arab region have demonstrated extraordinary strength and resilience. Civil society provides a means to harness the drive and build sustainable change that comes from the grassroots. I think it's very important to realize that the mechanisms for women's participation for peace is there. But the question, again, it comes every time the UN comes with a res wonderful resolution with good words, at the end of it, it has to be the member states that has to implement it. There is no, and the member states that are at war with its own people are not going to implement peace and security for women only. So it's very important to understand that, uh, you know, uh, you know, the resolution may sound wonderful, yes, and it says women should be participating, but political will is a, is a big challenge. Resource, setting resources for it is, is a big challenge. You have 22 countries in the League of Arab States and only two, and another country, you know, are, are the only ones that actually have national action plans, which means they haven't actually implemented it. They have it, but they haven't implemented it. So that's one. Another thing is, um, when you have a country that is having a problem, you know, enforcing the laws in the constitution for women's, uh, again, for, 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 uh, for women's uh, rights uh, issues, um, they are not going to come up with the money to enforce those laws. So I think it's just dead on arrival every time you have a new constitution, but it's at least, it's a framework that uh, women can use. And I think 1325 has been that framework that women are using and insisting that, uh, you know, women should be participating. Uh, the last uh, thing that I would like to say, 1325 is, uh, you know, has four pillars, protection and participation uh, and prevention of violence and, uh, you know, uh, for women. But the United Nations itself does not have a woman invoice. You know, you don't, where are the demonstrators of this, you know, where are the women? So they're really, they don't implement their own resolutions. So that's a problem. So when a member state is looking at the UN, and they don't see the woman invoice and the woman participating or insistence of women to participate in these peace processes. Of course, they are not going, that, that gives them an easy way out. So thank you very much, but it's complicated.